Inflation or specifically hyperinflation is one of the driving factors for all sorts of investments including Bitcoin and crypto. But what does hyperinflation actually look like? How does it happen and what are the consequences? We answer all questions by the example of the hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic between 1914 and 1923 and look at potential parallels we see around the world today. The consequences, mass poverty, hunger and unemployment, food job lootings, economic standstill and the rise of the extreme left and right with Hitler taking over afterwards. These were the catastrophic effects next to many curiosities like people carrying around money in wheelbarrows, suitcases full of money being stolen but the money getting left behind, or drinking a cup of coffee in a cafe that costs 5000 marks when you order it, but 8000 marks once you finished it. And with that I welcome you back to another video here on the channel. Today we talk about hyperinflation as you could have guessed by now. And the book that I read in preparation for this is When Money Dies by Adam Ferguson, which documents the hyperinflation of the Weimar Republic and I can highly recommend it. Now first of all, what is hyperinflation? Professor of Economics Philip Kagan first classified it as meaning 50% inflation within a single month. This definition is sort of arbitrary, but I mean you have to define it somehow, so we roll with it. So far, there have been 53 cases of hyperinflation. These can be found in the Hanke Cruz hyperinflation table. When you look at it, a clear pattern becomes visible. With one exception, the hyperinflation during the French Revolution, all cases of hyperinflation took place within the last 101 years. All of them, every single one, took place on a fiat money standard, not a single one on a commodity money standard. There has been severe inflation in ancient Rome due to coin clippings and the resulting debasement, but this took many many years and is not considered a hyperinflation case by the definition given. So 53 cases of hyperinflation in the last like 100 years. But how does it happen? First of all, an unsound and inflatable fiat currency seems to be the requirement. The common pattern is an already weakened economy that gets hit by an economic shock like a war, awful policies and maybe a pandemic. This economic shock leads to reduction of economic output and therefore a reduction in tax revenues. These are the prerequisites, now comes the cause, money printing. This is done to compensate for the missing tax revenues. Increasing the monetary supply leads to inflation, not necessarily instantly, as shortages of money can exist and because the velocity of the money is a key factor, but once the ladder picks up the depreciation of money is inevitable. In Weimar it took two years after the start of the hardcore money printing before inflation really hit. In the US and around the globe, the quantitative easing as a reaction to Corona is already leading to inflation, but we are far away from hyperinflation. More on that later. Now let's head into the Weimar example. It's 1916, we are in the middle of the First World War and Germany is in trouble. The war was financed through borrowing and money printing. On top of that, Germany needed to hand over their African colonies and worse than that, there were colossal costs and reparations that Germany had to pay to the Allies. I mean, talk about an economic shock in an already weakened environment. The elements were present for the most devastating monetary collapse that any industrial nation has ever known. Prices were rising, living standards falling, poverty was around the corner. And the effects of inflation go way further than just rising prices. You'll see more examples of the devastating consequences during the Weimar story. One thing that happened at this time was that everyone became a speculator and started gambling on the stock market. Gambling on the stock market had become the fashion. The only way to avoid losing all one's money and perhaps to add to it. And I believe that this speculation is currently happening as well with everyone becoming a stock or crypto gambler. What's even more interesting is that in the past this was regarded as the trigger of inflation instead of a consequence. The exact same thing is happening today. The Weimar government refused to see monetary expansion as the key factor when it comes to inflation but blamed external factors like currency speculators. Dr. Rathenau expressly and publicly declined that the printing press had any role to play in that permanently spiraling sequence of events. And neither the most successful businessmen, nor the politicians, nor the bankers with distressingly few exceptions perceived any direct connection between inflation and depreciation. Same story a century later. The falling living standards turned into societal unrest and political division. The far left and far right were on the rise. The German National People's Party on the far right trebled its votes while the far left doubled theirs. I think that this societal division is another parallel we are starting to see today. Hitler's rise was encouraged by what had happened. Basically people were getting tired of democracy and associated the state form with their living standards. In 1920 smaller salaries have only been increased two to four times. This makes an impossible situation when the cost of living has gone up tenfold. And in August 1920 it became clear that Germany will be unable to keep paying the reparation costs, so the reaction was 
the mark fell from 310 to the pound to 400 to the pound within a month. Mr. Joseph Edison, counselor of the British Embassy in Berlin, put it succinctly. The daily creation of fresh paper money, which the government requires in order to meet its obligations both at home and abroad, inevitably decreases the purchasing value of the mark and leads to fresh demands, which in turn bring about a further decline and so on ad infinitum. This was the truth, but everyone either didn't understand it or didn't want to hear it, or knew it but didn't care. Those who did understand it acted by getting their hands off of the unsound money. Evasion of taxation, fear of socialization and inflation have combined to drive capital out of countries with a depreciating currencies into countries where the currency is sound or at a premium. And well, when trust in a currency fails, the inevitable happens. The mark slid from 400 to the pound in September 1920 to 10,040 to the pound in November 1921. These are still baby steps when compared to what's about to happen. The big industrialists are attempting to save something from the wreck by turning all the paper marks they can into foreign currencies or failing that into real things, land, machinery and so on, which have independent value. The incentive to saving is gone just when saving is of vital necessity to the state. The Jews were better at these financial matters. They simply realized that the currency was failing earlier than others. They were sharper. They made better decisions and were hated for it. Anti-Semitism was on the rise and so was the chaos in the cities. In Vienna, a group of 30,000 looted food shops and other stores while wrecking the whole city. It was natural that a people in the grip of raging inflation should look about for someone to blame. They picked upon other classes, other races, other political parties, other nations. They were in large measure still blaming not the disease, but the symptoms. Inflation finished the process of moral decay which the war had started. All this is obviously completely horrible, but we haven't even reached a stage of hyperinflation yet. Reading the book, it's remarkable to learn about how people just didn't get what was happening. It still appeared to most Germans that the dollar was going up, not that the mark was falling. That the price of food and clothing was being forcibly increased daily, not that the value of money was permanently sinking. And today the reaction of most people would probably be the same. More people complain about the rising prices, which is more of a symptom, rather than their falling currency. In April 1922, the slide into hyperinflation became a real threat. The mark fell from 1,600 to the pound to 2,200 to the pound within a week. Since the beginning of the war, the income of a working man has increased 34 times. The cost of living, however, went up 86-fold. At the end of August 1922, the mark passed 9,000 to the pound. This was simple commerce. The only thing to do with cash by that time was to turn it into something else as quickly as possible. The occupation of the Ruhr by France and Belgium was the last nail in the coffin. The idea was to pressure Germany into paying the reparations. What it did was it paralyzed Germany's remaining industry. Hardly anyone worked anymore. The mark fell from 9,000 to the pound in August 2022 to 35,000 to the pound on Christmas to 48,000 to the pound on the day after the invasion on the 11th January 1923. At the end of January, the mark reached 227,500 to the pound. 100,000 mark notes were issued and a million mark note was next. Here we reach the point where you can clearly see that the money is dying. We have reached the stage of hyperinflation. There were stories of shoppers who found that thieves had stolen the baskets and suitcases in which they carried their money, leaving the money itself behind on the ground. A 5,000 mark cup of coffee would cost 8,000 mark by the time it was drunk. People became incredibly hungry. Whereas the first part of the inflation period was all about what luxuries you need to do without, it was now a matter of what necessities you need to do without. The mark went from 800,000 to the pound on July 7th, 1923, to double the amount on July 23rd, to 5 million to the pound on the 31st. Loss of faith and confidence in the state and oneself was real. Also, the taxation system had entirely broken down. Living from day to day, the government did not seem to care. Of the expenditure during those few days of 12,000 million marks, only 4% was found from taxation. Just the interest on the debt was actually higher than the whole taxation. On September the 20th, Germany established the Wucher Polizei, which raided restaurants in Berlin and forced everyone there to hand them all the foreign currency they had. This desperation tactic by the state yielded some results, but obviously something goes on only until the moment when it cannot. And that moment comes suddenly.
Business became completely impossible at this point and no one would even accept the mark anymore. Calculating the fair price of goods in marks just became too burdensome and all debts and savings have been completely extinguished. The only hope left was to somehow bootstrap a new currency into place with the little reserves left. Which is exactly what happened. On November the 13th, Dr. Schacht was appointed Commissioner for National Currency. A million million marks were equivalent to one gold mark, which was a perfect timing to go back adopt the gold standard. This meant stabilization. One gold mark on the other hand equaled one renten mark. The Rentenmark was in its literal sense a confidence trick. It was said that it was backed by land. However, you couldn't change the Rentenmark back into land, so it wasn't backed at all. But people didn't care anymore. They just wanted a new and hopefully stable currency. And it actually worked. This shows how money only works if people believe in the value of it. Here the most interesting part of the Weimar story actually ends. Germany still had many problems going forward like the mass bankruptcies, but the worst was over. The mark disappeared, the rent and mark was brought in, and it was based not on gold, of which there by that time wasn't really enough, it was based on the, based on the notional value of land, um, which incidentally was the same as the assignat of the French Revolution um, in, 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 in the 1790s. Um, it meant nothing, people couldn't take a rent and mark and go and buy a bit of land with it, but because people were in such despair, they were prepared to believe in this new currency. Uh, the Rice Bank s stopped discounting uh, treasury notes. And so inflation stopped just like that with an astonishing speed. Now, the effect of having the rent and mark and, and a currency everyone believed in uh, was very remarkable. In the first place, because people believed in it and, and uh, the food started flowing into the, from the country into the town again. The, um, the farmers were prepared to accept the rent and mark in exchange for the food. The problem in the towns was that nobody could afford, the, afford to pay for it because they'd, they'd lost all their money. But at least this was a basis on which something could be, could be done. Uh, unemployment, unemployment again got much worse. But you know, within two years, um, the Ger a German economy was being reconstructed and working. So how can we recap this whole incident? Adam Ferguson did it in the prologue of his book. If you wish to destroy a nation, you must first corrupt its currency. Thus must sound money be the first bastion of a society's defense. Now that we've finished the Weimar story, let's look at a few more similarities about what happened in the 1920s in Germany to what is happening today, 100 years later, in the US. The consumer price index is a measure of inflation and is currently on the rise. The rise is steeper than economists predicted, which is not surprising to be honest, however it is still very moderate. Many consumers are still scared of the future, which leads to a low velocity of money. Once this picks up, inflation could rise a lot higher than it has so far. Also remember, in Weimar the inflationary effects happened two years after the heavy printing started and not immediately. But to be clear, the US dollar heading into hyperinflation has a very low probability in the near term. That inflation is not transitory is pretty clear though if quantitative easing continues, which it does. As a world reserve currency you could also say that the US dollar is too big to fail. And while, like I said, the chances are very low, I wouldn't completely neglect it. Especially when your time horizon is longer. As Robin Williams said, too big to fail, that's like saying too fat to diet. And what can you do when you expect that inflation is on the rise? Well the first natural idea would be to short cash. Which you can do by taking on debt. Look at the Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy playbook. They believe in a continuing depreciation of the US dollar and bet on Bitcoin as the rising sound money, so they take on debt to invest in Bitcoin. The markets being at an all-time high are not a representation of a strong economy, but of a depreciating currency and speculation. Next to the classical investments like real estate and stocks, cryptocurrencies play an increasingly larger role. Bitcoin is regularly described as an inflation hedge. I'm not sure if that's the best description, but Bitcoin certainly has the characteristics of a sound money. In general, different cryptos take on different paths. Many people call Bitcoin deflationary, which it is not, at least not by design. It is still inflationary, but with the issuance getting lower and lower, being programmatically fixed and kept at 21 million coins in the year 2140. The circulating supply already sits at 18.75 million coins, so most of the coins are already issued. However, the supply could actually be shrinking instead of growing as people lose access to their keys and the associated coins are lost forever, making the remaining ones slightly more precious. Ethereum on the other hand falls into another category which are much more governed supply and changing policies. 
A future update would make Ethereum ultra sound money in some Ethereum's minds, but I disagree with that because something can't be sound if the policy can change again in the future. Ethereum's supply is neither fixed nor really predictable as the policies can change, and did change over time. The third and final category are predictable but uncapped coins. Doge is part of this class. New coins get issued forever, so Doge is clearly inflationary, but at least the supply schedule is predictable. When it comes to sound money, I would choose Bitcoin over any cryptocurrency any day of the week. That's it for this video, I hope you enjoyed it and also learned something from it like I did when I read Adam Ferguson's book When Money Dies, again I can highly recommend this if you want to go more into depth, of course this has like 260 pages or something like that and this is a fairly short video so not all detail was presented here. If you enjoyed the video, I would highly appreciate it if you subscribe and leave a like on this video and then I see you next time.